So let me ask you a question. Do the ends justify the means? Or, to put it in a specific context, if you had access to a time machine, would you go back in time and kill Hitler? Why or why not? I think this might be at least one of the questions asked by our gospel story today. We've got Jesus here at the very beginning of his ministry, even before his, his first sermon. He's just been baptized. He's just heard God's unconditional acceptance of him for who he is. Maybe he's just beginning to think about what it is that God has in store for him. I wonder if at this point in the story he has any clue where this road will take him that eventually it will bring him to the foot of a cross. But let's just say for a second that he knows that it's his job as God's son to do God's will on earth. The question is, what is that will? The temptation set before him by this mysterious figure in the wilderness get to the heart of that question. Is it God's will that he starve to death for his piety? Is it God's will for him to rule the nations in justice and peace? Is it God's will that Jesus give up his life, that he should leap to, from the temple to prove his faith in God? Each of those questions is about an ends, an outcome. But each of Jesus' responses arises not from a desire to do the right thing, but to do rightly. In other words, for Jesus in this story, the what seems to be more important than the how. Excuse me, less important than the how. It's an important distinction. In each case, rather than trying to think ahead to what God wants him to do, he instead rests on how, on how God wants him to do it. For example, instead of trying to decide whether it's better for him to continue fasting or to nourish his starving body, he instead defers to God. He says, if this fast has a purpose, he will wait until God reveals it. Each temptation invites him to take control of his situation, to take control of his health, his vocation, his faith. And each time he refuses. Each time, he instead chooses to relinquish control to God. He chooses to let go. Whether or not Jesus knows where this path will take him, we know that eventually he will be faced with the ultimate decision of what, whether to save himself or to let go of his life. This is the opportune time for which that adversary is waiting. And we know that when that opportune time comes, what choice he will make. But I wonder if we know why. Sometimes we're not really concerned about the why, right? We figure Jesus died and, that, and his death means our life and that's the end of the story. But as I read this, I think that why is actually the most important part. Because I don't think Jesus came to die. If that were true, he could have died in the manger and everything would have been fine, right? I think he came to show us how to truly live. He also shows us that leading that kind of life, the life that God designed us to live, to lead that kind of life in this world always means death of one kind or another. The fact that when that opportune time comes, Jesus chose to die rather than to kill says something to us. Perhaps a question we should ask ourselves is, what does it say? To help answer that question, maybe it's helpful to think of the story of Martin Niemöller, who we remember today. His famous confession expresses his remorse about not speaking out earlier against Hitler when he had the chance, but as I mentioned, not only did he not speak out, he wholeheartedly supported the Nazis as they came to power. Like many other conservative Protestants in Germany at his time, he was convinced that National Socialism would unite people and reinvigorate the church. 
Wasn't that God's will? Isn't that God's ultimate goal? He really believed that the people the Gestapo were arresting, communists and socialists and Jews, that they were threats to German unity and to the Christian faith. He initially saw Hitler's party as the answer to his prayers, the means by which God's kingdom might finally come on earth. Sadly, both for Niemöller and for the rest of the world, the opposite proved to be true. As I read about his story, I think that Niemöller got so caught up in the what, in the salvation of his people, that he was blind to the how of how the Nazis were attempting, attempting to accomplish that end. With the benefit of hindsight, of course, it's easy for us to see now that regardless of the promises made by Hitler about the freedom and the esteem the German churches would enjoy under Nazi rule, their means of bringing about those promises, their how, could only have one inevitable result. Niemöller learned the hard way what Jesus seemed to already know in the wilderness, that whenever you play the devil's game, you lose. We daily face our own temptations in the wilderness as we seek ways to faithfully respond to the problems and the issues of our own time. I wonder what we can learn from Jesus and from Niemöller today. What is the faithful response to climate change, to institutional racism? How are we as Christians to react when a large nuclear power invades one of its smaller neighbors? As I've wrestled with these questions myself, I keep coming back to one thing, to letting go. I see that where Hitler and the Nazis tried to save Germany by seizing power and taking control, Jesus instead lets it go. While Niemöller held on to his vision of an ideal Germany, he was seduced by what the Nazis offered. It wasn't until he let go of what he wanted to be true that he could speak to what was true. For me, when I look out at where we are and where we want to be, the first thing that I feel God calling me to do is to let go of the idea that it's my job as a Christian to save the world. I can't do that. That's God's job. But that doesn't mean there's nothing I can do. I may not be able to save the world, but I can act faithfully in each moment. That may never seem like enough, but I'm slowly becoming more and more convinced that it is. That the how is more important than the what. We would love to live in a world where poverty doesn't exist where war is unknown, where everyone treats each other and the planet we call home with respect and love. And we even hope that one day, with God's help, we might see this to be the case. But what is so often true is that when we try to achieve those things, we find ourselves furthest from them. It makes me wonder if those things are actually what salvation really is. If those were all the things that God really wanted, why wouldn't God have just started there to begin with? I wonder if God is actually looking for something else instead. When I look at Jesus, I don't see a man on a mission to save the world. Instead, I see a God so in love with us that they chose to take on our flesh and to live among us to stand beside us, even at our worst, even as we nailed his hands to a cross. I see a love that is relentless. And so I wonder if it is that relentless love, this love that is able to abound even when it's returned by hate and rejection and violence, that maybe that love is what salvation is. Because to love like that is to be one with God. I know that I'm not capable of that kind of love, not as I am. I still have too much of my own stuff in the way. I still hold too tightly to my ideas about the way things ought to be, right? I still want too much to be liked. I try too hard to hold myself at a distance from people so that I don't get hurt. 
I really want to be able to fix people's anxieties. And I take on too much in trying to do that because deep down I still believe that if I can't or if I don't, that I'm failing at being a pastor and a Christian and that I'm disappointing God. But I'm slowly learning to let go of those things, to let go of those parts of myself that hold me back from loving more fully. Some days I succeed. On others, I fail pretty hard. But I keep practicing because I believe that when my life and when this world and when everything else finally comes to an end, this relentless love is the one thing that will remain. God created all that is by that love and in that love and for that love. And so that love alone is my only hope of resurrection. Not just for myself, but for everything. Whatever happens in Ukraine, or with the polar ice caps, or on the Supreme Court, I believe that that love is the only thing that will ever move us forward. And I believe that because that's what I see in Jesus today. He trusts in that relentless love of God to sustain him in his fast, even more than he trusts in bread. He trusts in that love to bring peace to the nations, not in the right ruler. He trusts in that love to justify his faith. He doesn't need to throw himself off the temple to prove it. When Paul says that salvation is in confessing that Jesus is Lord, that's what he's talking about in trusting Jesus, in, in joining Jesus, in trusting that love. Because no one who trusts in that love will be proven wrong. And so trusting in that love, I daily practice letting go of whatever it is that might hold me back from it. My anger, my frustration, even my hopes and dreams, if that's what I need. I confess my failures and I let them go. I acknowledge the parts of myself that stand in my way and I let them go. I hold in my hands all the hopes and dreams I have for this world of ours and I let them go. Not so that they can be destroyed, but so that they can be held by God. Because like Jesus, I trust that in God there is one who can faithfully hold these things while I cannot. And admitting that is a death in itself. As we embark on this Lenten journey together, I invite you to consider with me. What is it in you that needs to die? What is God calling you to let go of, to be able to receive and to participate in that relentless love?